Hello and welcome to Sports Quotes and Facts Untold. Today I'm joined by Johan Hammer, uh, BK Hacken defender and former Everton player. Uh, Johan, BK Hacken won the Swedish title last year, so you're in Europe and you've had quite a busy summer, it's fair to say. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's been a lot of games, a lot of qualifying games for Europa League and Champions League, but now it's a short international break, which is quite nice. So uh, yeah, it's been it's been a busy summer. Yeah. So we'll just start at the the very beginning of your career. Now you you started at uh, Malmo, one of the one of the biggest clubs in in Sweden. What are your sort of earliest memories of, of becoming a, a young footballer? Uh, I remember I have two brothers, and we were all obsessed with football. So we just played from a very young age. My first gift that I got from my grandparents was a football from the World Cup '94. Obviously, the year I was born. So, uh, yeah, it's just been football all around from from early years. And then uh, I played in a local team until I was 10. And then I got uh, signed by Malmo when I was 10. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's just been football as long as I can remember, really. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, you've played for them, and that's when Everton have spotted you. Before you moved to Everton, were there, were there lots of clubs that were interested in you at, at that age? Yeah, so I I was really talented when I was young, but then I had a, a tough spell between like 12 and 14. I grew a lot and, and uh, my, my motor skills weren't quite the best. And, and uh, yes, but then when everything kind of like wrapped together well, uh, I started developing my physique more and, and uh, was playing really well at 15, 16 got picked for like national teams and that's when Everton obviously scouted me and uh yeah I had like five or six clubs there where I could go on trial to it was uh Heron Fane who I also actually trialed for it was Everton it was a quite obvious choice to go to Everton because it was such a big club and really like stable club at the time uh Tottenham Glasgow Rangers and was one more Dutch team I can't remember who it was now but uh so it was uh, quite a bit of interest, but um, yeah, as I said, I went to trial for Everton and Heron Fame just to kind of compare the two, two countries yeah. and in different environments. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was an easy choice. It was a really easy choice. Mm-hmm. And in 2009, as you say, you were born in 1994, so you were you were only 15. But as you say, Everton were a very stable club. David Moyes had been there, um, you know, a decade. They'd just been in the FA Cup final as well. And, and yeah. Finch Farm was a brand new training complex as well. Um, so yeah, what was, it was it like when you first went there? Yeah, it was it was like uh, Malmo has always been a very good Scandinavian club, but when you go when you go to the UK and you turn up at a place like Finch Farm, it was just like my eyes were just I couldn't believe it what I was seeing like the pools and it's like eight nine incredible pitches uh, and it, it was just uh, I couldn't believe it. So <laughs> now I uh, I fell in love with it straight away. Uh, visited visited the city with uh, the scout at the time, Daniel Philpot, who I believe is an agent now or something like that. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just uh, ten out of ten, to be honest. Yeah, and you know, Everton are one of the biggest clubs in England. I'm sure you know a lot about them before moving, but there was a, a Swedish connection as well with sort of uh, Anders Limpar, Nicholas Alexanderson, Tobias Linderoth. What What did you know about Everton? What were your sort of memories of them growing up? My memories was. Um, the, the names that I then ended up actually training a bit, quite a bit. And <laughs> Leon Osman and Tony Hibbert. Yeah, it was just a huge club. And I knew of Wayne Rooney, of course, came from there. Yeah. Um, so it was just, uh, yeah, my biggest memory is probably the FA Cup uh, final there. Yeah. And then uh, they did well in Europe there just before I came as well, I think. Uh, yeah. Europa League. It was a Villarreal they lost against. That was in the Champions League, yeah. Champions in, League, yeah. 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 That, that was my biggest memories of Everton. Right. And then, obviously, the, the that summer you've had the trial. What goes into a, a trial at a Premier League club, Johan? It's just you go in and you go train with the team. They try and get to know you, I think, personality-wise as well. They came and visited my mom, mom and dad's house right. to see kind of like who, who, who I am and what I am as a person. Um, and... Uh, yeah, then it's just training, and we went for a like a preseason tournament down in South End. I think it was a little bit connected with Femi Orenuga, who was there at the time as well. I think in yeah. his transfer, there was like some sort of 
deal that we were going to play in that tournament. Um, and yeah, I think we won it. Uh, and we, I was the youngest one in the team, me and Hallam Hope, I think, because it, it was kind of like one year above uh, at the time. So yeah, it, it went really well. And uh, yeah, then because I was underage, I wasn't yep. allowed to move over straight away. So during the yep. autumn break from school and the uh, spring break, I went over and um, yeah, trained, uh, trained and played games and stuff. To, to kind of ease myself into it. And then the summer when I turned 16, I moved over permanently. Yeah. So when you move over, Johan, what, what's <laughs> the deal with that in terms of, did your family move with you? Did you live with a family here? What what was the, the setup? The setup was uh, the lodge down in, uh, in um, I forgot the name, now, Waterloo. Yeah, down in Waterloo. Yeah. Uh, and I loved it there. It was, uh, I was, I think I was the only foreign player though, uh, at yeah. the time. I think, uh, Everton is not a club that signs a lot of foreign youngsters. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of clubs that we played against had a lot more foreign yeah. youngsters. So it was uh, more me and players from like London and Manchester and Yorkshire and stuff like that. Um, right. But yeah, I loved it. So we lived in a uh, big house where we had like a, a couple who looked after us during the week and mm -hmm. a, a, a man who looked after us in the weekends, uh, cooked us food and, and yeah, helped us out too helped us grow up you could say yeah. <laughs> yeah. and what did you think of, of liverpool as a city you know what what would you get up to <laughs> yeah man was quite small at the time i think it was like 250 300 000, so not liverpool size um my idea of england was always london because mm -hmm. that's where i went to watch games when i was young uh so i thought everyone everything was like london but liverpool is more intimate and uh friendly a lot friendlier people i'd say <laughs> uh I, I realized that pretty quick when i jumped in a taxi the first question was always are you a red or a blue and, <laughs> and conversations kind of like went on from there so um <laughs> yeah that, that was um i realized there was more a uh, friendly town uh yeah. and also a uh yeah i was surprised by the city center is quite new than liverpool one and that so uh, mm -hmm. it was really really nice built up and yeah yeah and what are your memories of the coaches at Everton? And they were very tough on us. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, well, I remember my very first day, we had like a running test and uh, I was quite far behind physically because they trained in a different way in England. So it, it took me a while to, to catch up with them. So they were very tough. Uh, it was, um, I had Neil Dewsnip. Yeah. Is he in... Uh... I think he's like a club director now or something, isn't he? Somewhere. Yeah, so I think he's um there's quite a big Everton contingent at Plymouth Argyle now. And I think Plymouth, he's yeah, him and Conor, Conor Grant, right? Yeah, Conor Grant was there and I think Schumacher, who played for Everton about yeah. ten years before yourself, he's the manager there. So ah, and they've okay. taken they've taken a few Everton players now. <laughs> so that's where I think Neil Neil Dewsnip is now. Um yeah. what, did you work with uh, I know Alan Stubbs was was manager at a time and what, did you work with Kevin Sheedy and Duncan Ferguson as well? Yeah, so I had Neil Dusip and Kevin Sheedy first, yep. and then uh, I moved up to the reserves after a year and a half, two years, and then uh, it was uh, Duncan Ferguson and Alan Stubbs, and also David Weir for a little bit. Um, right. So it was big, big names, and uh, yeah, obviously a lot of centre backs as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I I learned so much. Yeah, I was going to say being the same position as you did that really help in your development. Yeah, it did. It did. I remember Stubbsy gave you a lot of uh, uh, tips and tricks to well, how to deal with strikers like Duncan Ferguson. So yeah, yeah. it was uh, <laughs> it was good. Yeah. So what was, what was Duncan <laughs> like as well? Because obviously Duncan was caretaker manager for Everton at the time as well. What was what was he like on the training pitch? He's so different uh, on the pitch than he is off the pitch. Off the pitch, he's like the warmest, kindest person. I'm sure a lot of Evertonians know that by now. Uh, the, the work he does in the community and stuff. Uh, yeah, such a warm person. And then on the pitch, he's uh, very uh, demanding, very tough, and very, um, yeah, he, he, he wants you to develop. He wants the best for you, uh, you mm -hmm. can tell, but and uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a tough way. But I, I like that. Yeah. And at that stage, Johan, you know, obviously Pep Guardiola was at Barcelona at this point and sort of football was changing. What was the sort of style of play at Everton at that time? Would you be passing it round the back or would you still be going quite direct at that point? It was quite direct. Um, I feel like Everton's always been 
a club that's been very direct. The fans demand the balls going forward and demand a high intensity. So I feel like I was a bit surprised when they uh, appointed uh, Martinez, actually, after right. Moyes there. Um, yeah. I felt like that was a that wasn't the line that Everton was kind of like they should go for. Yeah. Um, because even though the football world went that way, I don't think the Everton fans expect the football to be like that way at Goodison. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, so it's uh, that that was a, a big, uh, <laughs> little bit of confusion for me. But uh, when when I was in Everton, it was still very much the David Moyes DNA, solid, yeah. solid defense, but still still a lot of creativity and a lot of mm-hmm. um, yeah, help yeah. helping each other out. Yeah, and just in terms of the the fellow youngsters that you were with, Johan, it was uh, I know Ross Barkley was in the team. He was coming through. Uh, Luke Garbutt, uh, Matthew Pennington, Tyus Browning, John Lundstrom. There's quite a lot of you, isn't there, that have gone on to forge really good careers? Yeah, I, I, a couple of months ago, I actually tried to remember who was in the team and I was like Googling a little bit to figure out where, where is everyone today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> we were called the golden age in a way because we obviously won the under-18 uh, Premier League. We were a lot of good players national team players most of us so um yeah it's good to see so many doing well yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to and see. have you have you kept in touch with any of the players you you played with at everton uh not that much a little bit with a few uh, sam kelly who was in everton for a while kept from norwich uh ties brown in a little bit now and then yeah. uh i actually played against connor roberts the goalkeeper we had in the youth team right. he plays for tns now so yeah the so game you went to yeah yeah. yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Uh, Matt Kennedy, who came from uh, Scotland. Scotland, yeah, he was in uh, Aberdeen when we played in the last qualifying time. Right. I think it's two years ago now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> a few, a few. Keep in touch with a few. Yeah. So when you won the league title, Johan, what was the you saw the <laughs> togetherness like? Was you know was it a strong group? Yeah, it was a really strong group. It was uh, a lot of good players and. And uh, yeah, it was. We obviously won a lot of games. We beat Liverpool and we beat Man U and Man City and all these like big rivals. Uh, a big memory is we beat Man U four three at uh, Finch Farm, and that was like a the point where we felt like okay, we could go all the way here. Um, nice. And then I think I injured myself in the semi final. That was against West Ham or Villa or something like that. So I actually missed the final at Craven Cottage against uh, Fulham. Nice. But uh, yeah, it was a, it was a strong group, very good dynamics. Yeah, and who were the, some of the players that you played against, Johan? In those, you know, Liverpool, United, City. Were there any names that you you faced that have really gone on, to, you know, to forge a career as as you have? Yeah, the, a lot of a lot of players. The nice. obvious ones are obviously Paul Pogba and Raheem Sterling and. And, uh, and uh, well, Eric Dyer was in our team at the time, of course. Yep. He's had a very good career. So, uh, yeah, and then I'm sure there's plenty, but <laughs> that you don't really remember. I think Pickford, probably played against Pickford. He was at Sunderland, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. I kind of vaguely remember him, but, but uh, yeah. So, yeah. the ones that stand out is Pogba and Sterling, I'd say. Pogba, yeah. What was it about them? Was it was it just really hard to get the ball off them and just the, the speed of thought, I guess? Yeah, Sterling was obviously he was really quick. It was uh, tough to play against him. Uh, he was by far the best player that Liverpool had at, at the time. And Conor Cody was there. Uh, right. he, yeah. he was playing very well. Um, Pogba wasn't that good then, I feel like. He was he's playing number nine against us. Right. Uh, together with Will Keane, I think. Yeah, Michael's brother. Michael's brother, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Michael also played, I think, actually. Yeah. So uh, Pogba was not the best then, but he yeah he became a good player, of course. And who who, we, who was your toughest opponent during those those Everton years? Do you think was it Sterling? <sighs> yeah, I'd, I'd say so. He he was a really good a really good player, and and uh, Will Keane. He had Wilkin. that like sharpness, the striker sharpness that was really really tough. And obviously back then as well, you know, you would have first team players uh, playing as well. Um, who were some of the, the sort of Everton regulars that you would have played with as well and obviously training with them as well? In the Everton first team? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so that was more when you move up to reserves, then you start mm-hmm. training more with them. And 
yeah. when it's like a European or World Cup summer, you go away with them in preseason because they need to fill up numbers. Uh, yeah. So we went to uh, Austria one summer, I think it's 2012. Uh, then there was a lot of big, big Everton players. Uh, yeah, Nathan Baines and they were all there, all the ones I named before, Osman, yeah. Hibbert, uh, Phil, Phil Neville and Andy Chebe and all, all the rest of them. So, yeah. Yes. And what was it like actually, you know, competing with the likes of, you know, Yakubu, Louis Saha, you know, for a young defender to play, you know, quality attackers like that? What was that like? Yeah, it was really tough, really <laughs> tough. Obviously, I was I was young and, and uh, inexperienced and I hadn't actually played centre-back for that long. I played centre midfield for, right. for a long time when I was young. So I was very good on the ball, but I, I lacked a bit of like the physicality that I needed yeah. against these players uh, mm-hmm. as a young player normally do you know yeah. I it took me a few years to kind of develop that and I'd say I realized that more after I left Everton um, right. so that's what I wish I would have had more at Everton the, the mm-hmm. toughness that I that I have now and like the physical side that I, that's now has become my strength yeah. in a way yeah because when you were at Everton, did you feel like you belonged? Did you feel like you had the quality to, to play in the Premier League? No, I, right. I don't think I did. Because of their physicality, I didn't think like I, was, I wasn't I was a ready senior player. So that's mm-hmm. why I went on loan to Stockport and, and stuff to try and like find a way and, and make myself realise what I what was demanded from me to, to play for, for a first team. Yeah. But it, it took me a while to, to kind of like find them triggers in myself. Uh, mm-hmm. but but I did eventually I'm very happy for it yeah and what was that experience like at Stockport to play you know men's football regularly yeah so the football wasn't great uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've always preferred the passing passing football more of the Guardiola football uh, than maybe the Everton football to, to be completely honest but uh, that's also why I found it a good challenge to, to go to Everton because I wanted to develop that yeah. So uh, I want to expose my weaknesses a little bit and see how far far mm-hmm. I could become with it. And uh, yeah, so uh, Stockport was tough. He was yeah. uh, <laughs> playing against big, big strikers, big man, and I was yeah. I learned a lot during my yeah. months there. Yeah. Yeah. And just to ask about, I think Ross Barkley is probably the player who has sort of <laughs> uh, you know played in the Premier League for the for the longest amount of time. What 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 was he like as a as a youngster? Did you could you tell that he was going to make it? Yeah, he was so far ahead of everyone. Right. Good on but with both his feet. Like his physique was was the key point, I think. Yeah. Uh he was just a, a really strong, like good box to box midfielder. Mm-hmm. Um remind me a lot a lot of Jack Rodwell. Uh, right, yeah. to be honest. Uh with a bit more edge to him, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, it was just unbelievable. When he broke his leg with the national team and then he was gone for a while. Then when he when he came back, he I almost thought he was he was a better player. Right. Wow. I, couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it. So it was like, yeah, he uh, he obviously had what what it t- took to become a good good player. Yeah. yeah. And I mentioned the sort of togetherness in the team. Would would you guys obviously you were all young lads? You were at the lodge together. Would would you socialize together as well? <laughs> yeah, we did. The the lodge group became one group. Uh, there's always groups in all teams, of course. Yeah, and and uh, the the scouts boys, the Liverpool boys, they kept together more. I think they they have a better chemistry. And, and me and the London boys and a Polish goalkeeper that came in, Mateusz Taudul, yeah, who plays in Cyprus now. We uh, yeah, we kind of hung out a lot. Um, so, but to be honest, we trained so much. It wasn't a lot of social time. Yeah. It was <laughs> we trained a lot. It's uh, you are literally a product that needs yeah. to just grow mm-hmm. and grow and grow. So yeah. the social life during them years wasn't maybe the best, <laughs> to be honest. And obviously we mentioned, you know, Finch Farm, world-class facility. Obviously there's a lot of uh, focus on your development as players. But at that age as well, what, what is the sort of gym work like? Are you, you know, are you trying to become more physical at that time? Yeah, so we had uh, a normal week would look like the Monday we normally had like a calm calm gym session in the morning yeah. the football at like 10 10 and 12 to 12 lunch football again in the afternoon um and then tuesdays and thursdays we had two gym sessions right. on uh, each day uh wednesday was completely off for school work yeah 
uh, on a Friday was more preparation for the game. So it was, uh, I'd say, gym four or five times a week, uh, upper body and lower body. Uh, yeah. A lot of body weight, though, especially for the upper body, because they were mm -hmm. very protected uh, with the back. They didn't want us to hurt our backs at such a young age. Right, of course. Yeah. So um, it was uh, John McKeown. I think he's still there now. Yeah. Yeah. He was my uh, our fitness coach then. Okay. So I, I wish I would have lifted weights a little earlier. Right. Uh, when I started doing that, I started becoming more explosive, more physical. Yeah. Uh, obviously, confidence comes with it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what my body needs. I need to lift yeah. <laughs> kind of heavy to, to yeah. make my heavy body feel better, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it's different what people need. But yeah. Ross Barkley looked at the weights and he just bulked up. So he was uh, different <laughs> genetics. Yeah. And it's that thing in football because sometimes as a football fan, you know, you see sometimes that a player will suddenly come onto the pitch and you can tell they've put that work in. As a defender and as a striker, do you think that's where it's important to to bulk up as much as possible? And do you think sometimes players can go too far the other way and it, it can affect their game negatively? Yeah, definitely. Uh, like Traore at Wolves, he, he, it's gone way too far, I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh, He's explosive and a good player, but I feel like he he would be equally as good, if not better, if he just lost like ten kilos of muscles to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's more. I think it's more for like the likes of Beto now, the new striker, of course, who's yeah. looking really good. I think, and, and the defenders to to match the big strikers. Um, but it's becoming less and less now. I feel like mm -hmm. the old old school football as well, the big physic, uh, yeah, fighting mentality. Now it's. Mm -hmm. John Stones is not a huge, huge lad. Uh, neither is Nathan Aki. Yeah. Uh, so um, you, you get by now as a, as a <laughs> less physical player, I say. And would uh, would Duncan Ferguson get on the weights as well? He would, but not not as much. Yeah. Like to uh, <laughs> just score goals, yeah. join in on the finishing uh, sessions and. Yeah, scored every time. So every time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And obviously you mentioned then, Johan, you know, Wednesdays was for schoolwork. Um, what would that incorporate in terms of, you know, how many subjects were you doing? You know, were you doing exams at that point as well? Yeah, so the boys did like sixth form work. Uh, right. the, the English boys. I uh, wanted to continue my Swedish school. So I did mine at the school. We were at Chesterfield. Um but uh, I did my own work. So I sat in my own room and did my own Swedish work distance right. school because I wanted to finish what I've started already my my college work there. So mm -hmm. I uh, I wasn't actually in the same classes as the other boys, but yeah. it was uh, just normal school. It was trying to squeeze in as much as possible in one day. Mm -hmm. Right. And you mentioned, you know, that, that Everton team, as you say, was very stable, really good players. And David Moyes was a massive factor in that. Did you have many conversations with David Moyes? Would you ever go into his office for, for chats? Or because you were a young player, did you not see that much of him? The first two years, not much. He always uh, acknowledged you when you see him and uh, gr a great person like that, uh, Steve Round as well. Yeah. But it was more when you start getting closer to the, to the first team with the reserves, uh, that when they approach you more and talk to you more. Um, I, like I said, I was never really close to playing for the first team uh, yeah. at the time there. So it was in a lot of like football conversations. It was more like development and think about this and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was a few, a few bollockings as well. I remember one time we, we went to Austria uh, and played like a uh, in-house game, kind of the first team against the reserves. And I uh, remember I tackled, uh, I think it was Leon Osman twice. Uh, pretty pretty bad tackles, and uh, Moyes uh, stood on the sideline. He was like, "Hava, what the fuck are you doing?" He yeah. <laughs> wasn't he was very happy. Like during preseason, injured one of the best players. So uh, <laughs> that was the uh, one one encounter I had with him. Yeah, yeah. But you think uh, you know? Obviously, you don't want to injure the first team players. But obviously, you you were you were saying that you you were you know growing at that time and being more physical. You know, there's an element that this is your chance to shine. You've, you've got to show them what you're about and, and earn the respect as well. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I know myself now, if a young player comes up and they uh, do tackles like that and they uh, try and uh, yeah show themselves, 
uh, in a good way and work in ethic and stuff, then you appreciate that a lot more than yeah. someone who comes in and kind of hides a little bit. So mm -hmm. I feel like I could have done maybe more of it, actually. Uh, been a bit more uh, nasty, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when your time at Everton was, was drawing to a close, now I noticed that you actually left the club three days after Roberto Martinez was appointed. Had yeah. it already been decided with David Moyes that you that you would be leaving? You know what what was the conversation? <laughs> How did that come about? Yeah, so I we started talking a little bit in February, uh, kind of like in line with the loan there to Stockport. That start looking around a little bit. We're we're thinking probably not going to extend your contract, but let's see how it goes the next few months. See if you develop more. Um, so I was I was on trial there in Malmo. I was trying in Lecce in Italy as well during uh, April and May there. Uh, and the final meeting I had was there, I think, in April with uh, Alan Stubbs and David Moyes, mm -hmm. where they said, uh, yeah, your, your work ethic is great. Talented player, obviously lacking the physical parts right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's where we, we all kind of ended with the Blues. Yeah. And what's the, what's the process like, Johan? Because obviously... In terms of your life away from football, you know, that's uh, that's a big thing that you've done to move abroad at such a young age and you were at the lodge. How quickly is the process that you, you know, you cut ties with the club? Is there, was there any aftercare at that point in terms of just looking after you or were you basically in the football world alone then to, to go and find your new club? Yeah, no, Everton helped a lot. Yeah. They gave me time off uh, for the trials. Uh, they contacted a couple of clubs, clubs themselves. I think Nottingham Forest was Oldham Athletic was on the on the board for quite a bit there. Um, but I, I felt myself that England wasn't the place for me to be at the time. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I needed something else uh, to to grow my game. Uh, so. Um, of course, if Everton would have wanted to extend, it would have been tough to say no. <laughs> Yeah, but I think cool. now and afterhand, rather than getting stuck in like the 21s there and playing yeah. uh, not competitive games, the way things worked out as is probably the best now yeah. when I look back. Yeah. And you mentioned that Lecce were interested. I also read online that Chievo Verona at, at one point came in. Sorry. Yeah, that's who I went to trial with. It wasn't Lecce, uh, it was Chievo. Ah, Chievo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Sorry, obviously, yeah. yeah. So obviously, as a as a young footballer, you mentioned the Premier League. I'm sure you knew all about Serie A. So was it as you mentioned then that you were looking for you know the right league to play in in terms of your physicality as well? Was there ever a point that you thought you would move to Italy, or did you were you thinking that it was right to go back home? So the trial went quite good in Kievo, um, but they couldn't promise first team football either. Uh, so it was kind of the same story then. Uh, even though I did feel like the Italian football did fit me a bit better, uh, a bit slower, more tactical. Um, so yeah, but but um, Malmo had like a better plan for me, and they were doing really good at the time. Swedish champions had a Champions League qualifiers coming up. So uh, yeah, it was, and also go, going home for a bit, you know. Seeing yeah. people I haven't seen for a bit it was quite quite nice actually. Yeah, and at that time, Johan, as well, you were in and around the the Swedish uh, national team in terms of the age levels. You played a game for the under seventeens, and then th you you were capped thirteen times by the under nineteens. What was that like for your development? Because obviously, at that point as well, you're playing with like the best of the best of of the age range. So that must have been a massive. <laughs> point yeah, that was great. So we had a really good under nineteen team. Um, mm. A lot of players play play very very high levels now. Uh, Greece, Victor Lindelöf, uh, right. some play in Germany, uh, MLS. We had we had a very good very good team. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that was a big uh, a big uh, a big confidence boost. Like you said, it gives yeah. you uh, gives you an eye. You come to the, your own club with a bit of a different uh, view of you, you get viewed on differently. When you're in yeah. the national team, I feel uh, so. That was good. I, I wish I would have made some 21 games too. To be honest, mm -hmm. I felt like I I should have. I was uh, very close to the call up a couple of times, uh, and in my opinion, I probably should have been called up, but uh, yeah. I never was. So, yeah. And I know in England, Johan, you know some football fans will look that 
certain players are picked because of the teams they play for. Do you think perhaps if you had stayed in England or Italy, you might have got a better shout just because of how things are viewed sometimes? Yeah, so Sweden was actually the opposite way, I felt. It oh, really? Right. Like the, the, the players that played in Sweden, yeah. it was easier for them to keep track of their uh, development. Yeah. A lot of them played first team football because mm-hmm. the league isn't as good. Right. Uh, so they ch- chose them, I'd say, ahead yeah. of other players. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which is and strange. That, yeah. And at that age as well, obviously, when you're with the national team, you don't have that many days or weeks to, to be in and around the squad. So what's that like when, you know, at such a crucial stage of your development, how much of the, you know, the national team will, will tell you what to do, what not what to do, if that makes sense? You know, obviously you're with your club a lot more. How much influence can a national team have on you at that age? It's not so much, I don't think. No. It's more of a platform to uh, to show people what you can do. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, for me, the national team never really developed me. Yep. It was literally just a confidence uh, factor for me. The, the the development all happened at Everton. Yeah. And when you moved to Malmo, I do need to ask about Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Um, I know that there was a bit of controversy a few years ago because he invested in Hammerby, a rival. But, you know, obviously, being born in 1994, you've you've grown up watching Zlatan. How big yeah. an idol is he to, to young Swedish footballers? Yeah, huge. He was... Uh... It's uh, undescribable, to be honest, how big yeah. he is for us, especially for us who come from Malmo, where he's from, and he did uh, the path that we all kind of wanted. So he's uh, he's big. He is bigger than the king. I know he loves to say it himself, <laughs> but he, he actually is uh, in yeah. Sweden. And so, did you ever uh, have the, any opportunity to meet him? I have met him a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. right. I have. And... So uh, good guy. Yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's uh, yeah. very good confidence and very uh, thinks very highly of himself. But but yeah. so we should because what he's done is is absolutely unbelievable. So yeah. uh, so but yeah, there was controversy versus mm-hmm. today when uh, he signed for LA. I think in the deal that he got some sort of ownership. Yeah, that's with the one. Uh, yeah. Hammarby, another Swedish mm-hmm. team. Yeah. So and at the time they actually raised a statue of him in Malmo. Yeah. Because right. the, the people of Malmo always wanted him to have that. But then the Malmo fans are very hard to please. So right. uh, obviously he uh, he uh, yeah took the ownership over Hammarby, and yep. then big rival of Malmo. Yeah, meant that the uh, statue <laughs> got uh, demolished basically by the fans. So yeah, yeah it was uh, wasn't the best time for him maybe. And obviously on the pitch and in front of the cameras, he's he's got that bravado. He's very confident. Some would say bordering on arrogance. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. Is, is that is that Zlatan or is that part of a character he plays to be a footballer? <laughs> do you think? I think he needs that yeah. uh, character to to bring out the best of himself. Uh, I think he's like most people; he's a, a family man. Uh, yeah, you know, but but on the pitch, he's uh, becomes like a big child who just refuses <laughs> to lose. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned that you know the Malmo fans are, are very difficult to please. Obviously, you, you've come from Everton as well, where it's a very demanding fan base. Yeah. What's that like as a as a footballer when when you have those demands that you know you play for a football club where the fans are probably you know probably more passionate or more vocal than most? I think it's. Uh, I think they have all right to be. To be yeah. honest, I think it's. Uh, it keeps the place on their toes, keeps the mm-hmm. club on their toes, the board. I think uh, yeah, they they pay to go and watch the team. Yeah. They, I don't think they should have any say in anything like football terms or yeah. what manager to bring in or anything like that. But I feel like they, at at the during the ninety minutes, they demand the best, and so they should because uh, the Premier League players, especially, are very well paid. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, the least they can demand, I think. Yeah. And when you're at Malmo, you say the fans demand the best, and they got the best. You were, uh, you you won the league in twenty fourteen. Yeah, we won the league 13 and 14. I joined in the summer 13. Didn't yeah. make so many uh, caps there, but uh, we won the league. And then the year after 14, we won the league and qualified for Champions League for the first time. Yeah. So it was a very successful time for the club and it's uh, built a good platform to where the club is now. Yeah. So it's kind of special for me to first be doing that with Malmo, my boyhood club. Uh, yeah. And now I'm also doing it with uh, Hecken, of course. Uh, first time 
champions last year. We won the cup yeah. as well. Yeah. And now also Europe. So it's kind of like the big hat trick within yeah. eight, nine months. So uh, it's, it's uh, we're, we're building a good base now for, for Hicken for many, many years. Yeah. Because as you say, it was Hacken's first title. Uh, your hometown club Malmo have been very successful for a number of years. I think they've won around 26, 27 titles. <laughs> yeah. But that, like that. that time you were in the team, it was, it, you know, it was a really uh, big time for the club because, you know, they had um, they had Robin Olsen in goal, Marcus Rosenborg up front, Emil Forsberg, who's played at Leipzig. What was that like for you still being so young to, to be in and around that sort of experience? You know, you, you qualify for the Champions League and you were playing Atletico Madrid, Juventus, Olympiacos. I know you, you were a, a sub at Vicente Calderon and the Juventus Stadium. Yeah. That must have just been incredible. Obviously, you would like to play, but even then, it must have been a massive thing for your learning. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was huge. It was, uh, I, came, I came from Everton and I had a really good base. You know, I, I feel like I, could, I matched these players that you mentioned very yeah. well in training. Yeah. Uh, and a lot to I have a lot to thank Everton for for that they prepared me well for the first team uh, so yeah it was just incredible to see mm-hmm. in these stadiums and games and everything and that's helped me a lot now when we were qualifying for Champions League in Europa League this summer because yeah. yeah. I've already done that now we tried three times before with Hecken failed unfortunately and mm-hmm. then obviously twice with Malmo failed one time and then succeeded one time so it, i've done it now many times so yeah. it's uh nothing new now so you know what to expect when you go to like lithuania or you exactly. go to uh, scotland you know you know how you need to approach the game and, and stuff like that yeah and you mentioned you know when you first went to everton on, on that first day that the running test you felt you were a bit behind when you went back to malmo because of your experience did you feel that you were ahead or how did yeah. you feel that yeah you felt that that was a really big thing Absolutely, the, the physical yeah. Premier League is, it is so different to the other leagues, you know, yeah. it, it really is. I know people say it, but when you've had a taste of it mm-hmm. and then you go somewhere else, it's yeah. it's a massive difference. Yeah, It was, uh, sometimes I felt like in Malmö, is the training done already? Or we're already finished <laughs> because you built that kind of base already. Yeah. So, uh, and that's followed me through my whole career. It's yeah. uh it's, uh, yeah, I enjoy working hard. Yeah. And another player that made his name in England that you were was Pontus Janssen. Um, yeah. What's he like as a character off the pitch and sort of on the pitch as well? Yeah, so he loves to become uh, best friends with the fans where he is, of course. Yeah. Uh, he he uh, gets really just a slot that needs that like alter ego to become a good player Pontus needs that connection with the fans right with Malmo he got it for free because he was a Malmo boy like myself yeah. uh when he went to Leeds it's something yeah it's something he builds up with the fans he loves the interaction with the fans he loves to uh yeah just give them what they want because that's uh how he gets his energy so it's very different for people <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just to ask about two of the players I mentioned before Marcus Rosenberg you know he's he's played um, in some of the bigger leagues on the continent. But what yeah. was it like? Because he was just a, a scoring machine, wasn't he? Yeah, he was incredible. I've never played with a player who was as important as he was for Malmo right. at the time. He just set the standards in training, uh, the way he, he approached the big games. I remember he always said the words, um, never be, you have to want to win more than be scared to lose, if that yes. makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, normally, I think there's always like a, some sort of like you feel frightened to lose. Yeah. Like, I have things to lose, but the, the, the like the need of winning needs to be way more than that. So, uh, it sounds very simple, but it's uh, if you really think about it, it's uh, yeah, yeah, it, it really helped us. Yeah, quite profound. And then obviously yeah. Emil Forsberg as well has forged a really good career in the Bundesliga and has he sort of grown, hasn't he, with Leipzig as they've as they've developed as a football club as well. Did you did you expect him to be as as, as big as he as he's become? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I've always been very close to him. Uh, me me and my wife we we uh, know him and his his wife very well. Uh, right. So we I've I always expect him to be that good. He had a mentality, uh, the talent and everything. He was just uh 
fantastic player, to be honest. So I absolutely did expect that from him. Yeah. I think a lot of people raised their eyebrows when he went to Leipzig because I think they were in a slight the Bundesliga at the time. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, and they were like, huh, is he not going to go to like a Bundesliga team? Mm -hmm. But obviously the Red Bull projects, um, he, he knew what he signed up for. A lot of money being uh, pumped into the club and then the yeah, success was always going to happen at that club. And then he, when you're at, at the, um, when you follow the club the whole way from Svaiti, you become a king. Like number 10, he's been wearing a captain's armband. It's a uh, yeah, yeah. huge career for him. Yeah, and as you've just mentioned, you're obviously close to ML. What what's he like off the pitch as well? He's really different. He's right. a northern Swedener, not as hard. Uh, uh, yeah, he was more of a, a good guy. You know, more of a uh, always happy. No, no matter if we lost or, or won the games, he was always the same. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that was his superpower, I think. Yeah. And obviously, at Malmo there, the, the success, you were still really young, like really, really young. And you had a loan spell at Frederikstad. Uh, yeah, I went to Norway, Norway for a bit. So, what, you know, obviously in England, we have, you know, the, the Scottish League. What is the, the sort of makeup in terms of the Swedish League, the Danish League and the Norwegian League? You know, which, which is viewed as, as the strongest, so to speak? <laughs> I think it goes in periods. Um, right. When I grew up, I think the Danish league was very strong mm -hmm. uh, because you had FCK who qualified for Champions League a lot. Yeah. And Norway was also strong with Rosenborg uh, a lot of, a lot in the Champions League too. So Sweden were at the time a little bit behind. Mm -hmm. But when Malmo won the league there and qualified for Champions League 14, I think that's when Sweden kicked the door in a little bit and uh, yeah. became a, a... For me, I'd say right now it's hard to say i, I think it's very <laughs> equal but i'd say the swedish league is slightly better now yeah i, I do think so yeah uh it's uh the whole package the crowd uh, mm -hmm. the, the interest of football the, the amount of players i feel like denmark has maybe higher highs but we have more stable platform, I'd say. Yeah. And during that loan spell in Norway, can you? Is there is there a noticeable difference in terms of the style or the tactics? Yeah, Norway is more towards England. Right. Uh, direct football, box to box, uh, yeah. and then you have Sweden, who's more more Italian, I'd say. Right. Mixed between Italy and Germany, like tactical, but also uh, yeah, a little bit slower tactical technical and then the denmark i'd say is almost exactly like bundesliga uh, yep. a bit of a bit of everything a mix mm -hmm. yeah and then after frederickstad you went to orgreit is that the right pronunciation Orgreite, yeah okay <laughs> we'll say orgreit yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was looking at your career and i was thinking about the pronunciations quite difficult but obviously yeah. going there you were you were captain again you were still young how big was that for your developments as well yeah, that was the years where I learned first in football for real. I yep. got two full seasons, uh, went through good times, went through bad times. Uh, but that's when I I feel like football Sweden actually realized, okay, he, he's he's a good first in player now. Yep. Uh, and then Hicken signed me uh, after them two years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think the captaincy helped me a lot because I know Hicken at the time with the old sports director, he looked a lot of... He wanted to sign all the leaders. Right. So if you're a captain, you become a bigger yeah. prospect for them, I think. And what do you feel your captaincy style was like? Were you the sort of player who would put in a big tackle, or like lead by example? Or would you, would you like sort of shout at people in the dressing room? Yeah, I did a bit of both, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I demand the best in training. If people didn't yeah. train well, it, that, that pisses me off and still does. I, I can't deal with players who deal with players who can't, who doesn't put the shift in, you know. Yeah. Uh, and at the games, I'm more of a calm player during the games. I like to mm -hmm. make feel make everyone feel comfortable, know what they need to do, organize like the defense. Uh, so I'm not like the big shouting type during the games. Uh, I did it a couple of weeks ago, though, against uh, Gothenburg. The Darbo nice. lost 4-2. That's got very heated at half-time then. But uh, that happens very rarely, I think, with me. So just to talk about Swedish football as well, obviously, the I think a lot of people in England will know all about Graham Potter, uh, Ostersunds. Yeah. Um, 
do you think in terms of you know the Premier League, you've gone to the Premier League to develop, but do you think sort of um, English people could could thrive in Scandinavia the way Graham Potter has? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I feel not just Sweden. I think in in general, I feel like English players they are too too homebound. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. There there is a whole world out there of, of football in different ways, and if you can learn at all, then it's yeah. you 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 will learn more because yeah. the natural step for a Premier League player is if they don't make it there, you go to the Championship, yeah, and you move down and move down and try and move back up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say if you don't make it in the Premier League, go go abroad. Yep. Look at the Bellingham, the Sancho's. Go Germany, go to Denmark. Like do something else. Try and try and learn a new language. Like bro- broaden themselves a bit. Yeah, uh, that that's my uh, my opinion. Yeah, and in Sweden, you know, how big were Graham Potter's achievements seen? You know, was it a really big deal of what he achieved? It what he achieved there. Yeah, absolutely. It was yep. huge. Very, very much like what we're doing at Hekka now. Yep. <clears throat> it's a very good... Uh, for, for them, it happened a bit quicker though, so soon. Uh, yep. They also, I think they got down for a bit of money fraud and stuff uh, after, right. after he left. So mm-hmm. it happened faster for them because they didn't do everything completely right by the books. Um, yep. But it's a, sim- it's a similar story. Just mm-hmm. that ours is more like organic. We've done it from a yeah, from a from a solid base. Um, yeah. But it was huge, Graham Potter. Yeah, the Europa League, obviously playing against Arsenal, beating Galatasaray in playoffs. It was just huge. Yeah, yeah. And I read that he sort of, you know, some of his players, he would put them through like a comedy course. There was yeah. also like Swan Lake. What what would you be like if you were in his team? Would you be into that, or are you more focused on the football? <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I I would probably do it. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh... You can always learn new things. Yeah. If you don't try it, you never know, right? So you have to, you have to be open-minded. I feel like, mm-hmm. and not just uh, stick to what you know, because then yeah. you'll become good in that direction, but you don't see what, what what's around you. Um, so yeah. I, I would have tried, but it would have been <laughs> a different experience, of course. <laughs> I think he made him read poems to each other in, in the yeah, dressing yeah. room, and yeah, it was a lot of uh, yeah unorthodox methods yeah absolutely and then obviously you've you've had a hugely successful time at bk hack and how how many years have you been there now so this is my sixth season now and i just yeah. extended my contract for another four and a half years right so Brilliant. uh it's uh yeah i feel like i'm carrying the the club uh, values forward now the all the players yeah. are quitting that i that i learned from and now it's my job to uh maintain that in the club and, and uh, bring that to the new players so yeah. uh and uh, yeah it's an exciting time for us i feel like we can develop even more uh, yeah I, I believe in this i don't like the word project but i believe in this uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah the way the club is going i believe in it a lot so yeah. i want to keep uh, keep going on this journey that we're on so obviously to english football fans you know malmo they, they play <laughs> in europe they're one of the probably the most famous club i think over here and then you've got obviously IFK Gothenburg. What is the sort of BK Hacken Hacken story? Because I know, as you mentioned, that was their first title win. What's been their What's been their sort of history? It's been a yo-yo team up and down, right. uh, second league and the top league. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's been uh, so. So we have Gothia Cup. I'm, I don't know if you're aware of it, the big youth cup. Oh right, okay, yeah, the biggest one in the world. I think Everton went here the year after I left. Actually, uh, mm-hmm. they were invited. Um, so uh dr ferguson as well by the way with kevin sheeney right. so he was yeah. he was a big profile in the, in the city yeah. everyone wanted to take pictures with him wow. <laughs> so that that so that was that's the base that hicken has it's a yeah. it's the money it's an income source every year uh that, that gives hicken a a good yeah way to to keep developing in terms of the recent success what is behind it has it had has the club had investment has it just made good management decisions what what what's it been Yes, we had a sports director, uh, Sonny, Sonny Carlson. He, he uh, laid the base of the club, yeah. brought it to a really stable Swedish club. And then the new, the new management now, the new club director and the new sports director, I think they're more visionaries than he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was more of a hard working uh, generation. The yeah. new ones now, I think they developed it even more. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, just it's always been the same in a way. That's the strength that we have. We follow the same values. We play the same style. Just that now we have managed to sign better players, uh, yep. f- found a better dynamic in the group. Mm-hmm. The new uh, the new coaches staff uh, have done an incredible job since they came in two years ago. Because when they took over, we were actually last in the league. Right. So within a year and a half, we went from being last in the league to actually winning the league. So yeah. and <laughs> now Europa League group stage. So it's uh, they've done a great job. Yeah. Because as you say about the developments of the club as well, I know that uh, Bernie Traore has gone to Sheffield United. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so that's obviously it shows as well the development of the players that the Premier League clubs are, are interested. Yeah, exactly. So so this summer transfer window was really busy for us. Uh, nice. We lost a lot of good players now. So now it's kind of a rebuild now uh, ahead of the exciting autumn that we have with the gold race and the title race and the Europa and everything. So now yeah. I think we sold four or five players in the summer for a lot of money. So uh, yeah. we we have money now and now we need to just get the uh, <laughs> players, uh, the new players yeah. more involved in how we yeah. want to play. And what's it like? You know, obviously you're used to it because, you know, you are you're, you were born in Sweden, but that element of the season, not, you know, being in one calendar year and obviously what that means in terms of playing in the summer, and then you know, obviously, you have to play your European games then as well. Is that is that an advantage for you because you've been playing every week, or is it a disadvantage? How would you say it? Yeah, an advantage for sure. Yeah, I think right. Aberdeen came from two competitive games before they yeah. played us, and we mm-hmm. had twenty, so uh, twenty four or something like that. So we, yeah, we had it. We had a base, a solid team. We knew what we wanted to do. They looked a bit like taken by the moment I felt like in the first game against them right. uh, it was only the last 20 minutes that I kind of like realized shit we, we have to try and win this because it's a competitive game yeah <laughs> it's the first hour or 70 minutes we yeah played them played them off the park basically we, we, winning 2-0 and they got two very random goals I'd say at the end there yeah. but uh, yeah, over 180 minutes there we were the better team for sure yeah and just to go back to the the title success you said that you were you were bottom eighteen months ago. Was BK Hacken's title win a surprise, or were you one of the favourites in the season? No, I think we've been bigger favourites other seasons. So the right. last five six years have been very, very successful. Yeah, uh, but not making it quite to the top. But I think twenty twenty one we had a really strong team and people were were betting on us to win, um, and then obviously we didn't. Uh, yeah. But then uh, 2022, we came in with like no expectations, you know. Right. And for us players, when we start winning, like at the beginning, five, six games in a row, we felt like, okay, we can we can do this. Yeah. So you find a lot of inspiration in teams like Leicester as well, you know. Yeah. 2016, they won. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of like the mentality we had, like us against the rest in a way. Right. Uh, yeah. Everyone thought we were going to like, stumble and fall at the, at the finish line but we just kept going and kept winning and and uh, yeah that's the mentality we have in the team now we're, we're not scared of any, anyone so no uh, and I think, I, i'm pretty sure even now when we play by leverkusen in yeah. a couple of weeks away we're going to play the same way yeah you know it's it's the hacking way it might work it might not but it gives us clarity on the pitch uh, we know what to do you don't feel nervous because you know what to expect from ourselves yeah uh, and I think that's where I feel like Everton, um, with all the managing changes and everything, I feel like they've lost their identity. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you, if I want to draw like a parallel line here, uh, I feel like they, yeah. When I look at the players, I feel like it's better now. Mm-hmm. We should have picked up more points now at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the players look a bit lost sometimes, especially last year. Yeah, I completely I think agree. It's been too much, uh, too much change, and, and that's yeah. you, you then solely rely on uh, like quality in your uh, individual quality, and that's not evident for me. No, and it's as you mentioned, you know, they, they were so stable under David Moyes, and then changed to Roberto Martinez. I think that's a big thing to have so much stability for you know sort of 10 15 years i think that's been difficult for the fans and the players as well to 
to sort of keep going because it, it it's hard to to know where <coughs> where it's going to fix itself again. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's tough. And then for the place that that have had Moise for so many years, yeah, like, it was a new training schedule. I'm sure, new voice at the meetings. It must be really difficult mm. for the likes of Coleman and Baines and all the rest of them to like adapt to that new style. Um, absolutely. So uh, that's a challenge for 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 players. Even doesn't matter how old you are. There's always mm. a always new ways to learn and new new ways to find. You know. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, in terms of stability, you know, it's important that I think clubs go on a journey. And obviously, Hacken fans have been on an incredible journey. What's it been like to to hear the their emotions after you've delivered, you know, their first ever league title? Yeah, it's incredible. Like, uh, you, you feel untouchable almost. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I signed for Hacken, we didn't have a, much of a fan base. It was growing slowly, but nothing really happened. And everyone was kind of like waiting for that title just to kind of like... Hmm. Hit, this is it now now we're going to grow for real and we really have this year it's for the away games we have more people than ever uh, the Europa League games we have people going to the Faroe Islands for goodness sake yeah. like watching <laughs> us that wouldn't have happened so I, I try to explain that to the new players just you know this isn't always how it's been with the fans right uh, sold out stadiums every time we play at home almost it's uh, it's a diff- it's a completely different vibe in the club and and this plans of expanding the stadium, so it's really fun times. Yeah, and you won the Swedish Cup as well. Yeah, in the summer we won the cup as well. That was the yeah. third cup title in let's see, six years for Hicken. Right. So we've been a, we've been a cup team, kind yeah. of like Arsenal. We win the they win the FA Cup all the time, but never yeah. the title. <laughs> so it, that's how it's been for us. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was nice to. Uh, so yeah, we hold we actually hold the double right now. So uh, yeah. yeah. So do you think that this season will be more difficult just because teams are out to to get the title back from you? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Like Malmo play with different financial uh, rules here than we do yeah. after all the success they've had. So they should be up there and they are. Uh, Elves Boy, a local, another team that's nearby, are yeah. doing really well. Um, so it's us three basically fighting for it right now. Um, yeah. And they, they're all trying to grab it. And they don't play in Europe, none of them two teams. So that's yeah. a little disadvantage we have. We play, I think, 15 more games than they do, all in all, during the season. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot of games. And basically, I feel like I'm in the ice bath nonstop during yeah. the games. <laughs> so I was going to ask about all the, the European games. Obviously, um, we spoke after the, the TNS game. Um, and I, I sense that from Hacken, you know, as you mentioned, I was quite surprised when you said about the fan base because they had the away end and it was just non-stop noise, just incredible. And then, you know, there was that togetherness at the end of the game as well where, you you know, the players went over. Um, as you mentioned, you know, that, you know, that following must be amazing. But when you played TNS, you know, it was, it was quite a professional job, would you say? <coughs> yeah, it was. Um... It's always tough to go to the British Island and play games because uh, there's so many good players in England. Mm-hmm. Everyone plays football. Here we have ice hockey, we have track and field, we have the uh, floor ball. Like we, we have a lot of like different sports, but in England it's all football, basically. Yep. Yep. So uh, it's always tough, but it was a professional job. We, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we, it was quite... I don't want to say easy, but we knew that if we reach a good level, we w- we would yeah. beat them. To be honest, so uh, you were in control, I'd say definitely. Yeah, we were. They, I think, uh, when you go to the bridge challenge, if you have good possession on the ball, I think they get mm-hmm. a little bit surprised when it's not mm-hmm. so direct, and they get a little frustrated. And uh, so that's the key for us. I think we kept the ball really well. Yeah, and then when in that game you were drawn again at uh, Class Vika. Now. You know, I know that that was seen as a shock because, you know, I think it was yeah. their, their first win. Obviously, hugely disappointing, but were Hacken big favourites going into that game? Yeah, we were huge favourites. We, right. it's, a big, it's a big disappointment even to this day, I think. Yeah. Because uh, if we would have won that game, we would have already qualified for one Europe uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. group stage and we would have had a chance to, cha- to go to the Champions League. Yeah. So that was a disappointment for us. Uh, but uh, yeah, they uh, they were really solid defensively. To be honest, yeah. they did a really good job, and then they almost beat Molde from Norway as well. So they uh, 
they're in conference league now i think yep so, so yeah they did done a great job yeah in that situation obviously it's it's hugely disappointing but when you're in that game i think the second leg was three all um after extra time when you are the favorites do you sense um when, when you're not winning do you sense an element of of panic or worry you know what's it like to be in that situation as a favorite yeah we we haven't really felt that we've been very like safe and, and sound yeah. in ourselves but in that game definitely panic we did feel it like yeah. it's it's a lot about how the media portrayed the game and they were like saying oh it's a disappointment if they don't qualify and blah blah, blah. and then the fans read that and they obviously feel the same yeah so when it's like one all a half time or something yep. or what we even lose in half time they all of a sudden it's uh, <laughs> the fans start demanding more uh, yeah. and it's like hey come on now like we should be winning this game yeah. and rightly so i mean a, t- a team from Faroe islands with a couple of semi-professionals they shouldn't beat us yeah so um uh, but they never did we lost on penalties of course yeah so we haven't actually lost the europe game yet uh, yeah. but still never qualified for championship <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch yeah so in that situation <laughs> from the stands does it can it have a, a negative impact sometimes can you sort of not play your natural game do you have to sort of think more about what you're doing you're a bit more rushed maybe yeah yeah uh, i'd say that's what we lost in that game we lost our identity a little bit yeah uh, right and that's what's always been our uh, strongest uh, attribute mm-hmm. we we yeah. have a we have a clear plan what we want to do and we do it no matter we lose four nil or win four nil we mm. we do the same the whole game through we play out from the back we uh, create overloads in defense yeah. good counter-attacking team but also pressing mm-hmm. at the same time yeah we we, we lost our ways definitely. yeah i don't know obviously it's still very raw so i really appreciate you talking about it but when when you do have a set like back like that in football is it better that you did have many games to sort of bounce back yeah definitely yeah right like straight into the next one so yeah. uh, i think that's what was good for everton now with the doncaster game too uh, yeah throw the new striker in like let's get them all going yeah. a win you know feeling that like win and feeling change room after is priceless you know it's uh, yeah. you're going to the next game and you you have a different belief you know yeah yes yeah. uh takes a long time to build up that belief but it and it only takes a couple of defeats to completely ruin it all <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. it's important to keep winning because it to go back to everything as well it's really interesting what you say about the the pressure from the stands can can have an effect on the play and i think as you you know as we said about david moyes the the club was so stable and there's an element of expectation there even before moyes you know everton are one of the most successful clubs in england obviously the last 30 years that hasn't been the case but i guess when when you know myself as a fan in the gladys street when everton are losing at home to fulham and wolves there is a sort of frustration so you know do you think that that does have an impact on on the players you know as you say there's there's upheaval at the club anyway, but then there's the yeah. added elements of that expectation, which must be really difficult to to combat. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, the older generation Everton fans, they've obviously seen great times, so uh, it, it must be difficult to to watch what, what, where the club is at now. Yeah, but I think it, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's, I'm not. I don't run the club or anything like that, but. If you look at it from a different view now, when I'm like on the outside, I feel like it's time for new management, time for a new board. Yeah. Just kind of like start new, you know, yeah. and, and make a plan, a clear 10 year plan. Yeah. And make it public, like communicate with the fans, like this is our plan now. Like you're either in this plan with us or not. And then, you know, you, then the fans know what to expect as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you can't bring a new management and they're like, oh, we're going to win the league. No, that doesn't happen. Bring in a new management, bring in a new <laughs> new board and everything and like make a clear plan and then just have checkpoints along the way. Yeah. You know, that for me that's then the fans would also understand more. Because mm-hmm. what I'm understanding now on, on Twitter and in reading the, the echo and everything, I feel like uh, it's a lack of communication right now. Uh there's no uh you don't really work together as a club. I feel like the, the fans go one way and the, the board and directors don't really go the same way. And uh, yeah. then the players are stuck in between somewhere. So it's uh, it's yeah. more important than you think. 
uh, as a player mm. you you want that stability because mm. then you can really thrive you know you have a good a good ground you just keep going right yeah. so that's uh yeah, if, yeah. <laughs> i don't hold a crystal ball here or anything but that's uh, how i how i would have done things anyway. yeah and as a professional footballer johan when when a club comes in for you how much attention do you pay to things like that so for example if you didn't have your everton history and they came in for you this summer how much of the noise around the club would you pay attention to i would pay attention to it yeah i, I definitely would compare i would say compare everton and brighton right now mm -hmm. i feel like brighton is doing exactly what uh what everton should be doing yeah and everton can do it so much better because it's a bigger club bigger fan base there will be more uh, funds for Everton mm -hmm. if, they, if they start doing well because it's, it's such a high interest in the club so uh but but yeah like I said they, I think Brighton will attract better players yeah. right now than Everton will even if you earn more money at Everton right I, I truly believe so because uh the players that don't play for money are the players that you want in your team right uh, yeah because the, like the Mitoma guy I don't think he plays for money uh oh he's just a really good player and uh i think he wrote like an essay about like how to dribble or something in japan <laughs> i wanted to finish yeah. that uh, or something like that so yeah. i mean that says a lot like he's just a real football geek and if you have if you have 11 geeks on the pitch <laughs> you're gonna find ways to, to yeah. win games you know that's incredible <laughs> so uh yeah I, I was yeah i found that so cool the way he did that yeah and you talk about you know <laughs> Hacking, ha hacking similar to Brighton then in a way in terms of how the club has been built up yeah I'd say so I'd yep. say so so uh it, it's quite similar yep. uh, not the biggest fan base kind of coming from like an in-between stage mm -hmm. no one demands a lot the fans don't really demand a lot because they've never really seen good times yeah so uh so that's the challenge for us now it's been so good for so long that it's not always going to be that great for us uh during my next four years but as long as we have a clear vision of what we want to do and the fans are like in line with all that then that's how you that's how you grow up a club for me yeah and so obviously after the the champions league disappointment you were in the europa league and again you were in control you you went to lithuania and won eight one on aggregate yeah that was that was a big game for us away there yeah because we came from the disappointment uh we managed to win in between them games in the league uh and then we felt like okay if you want to do something in europe now we need to step up mm -hmm. and this team that we beat they beat malmo uh, the year before in the champions nice. league yeah uh, so we knew it was going to be tough and we yeah we played two really really good games there so mm -hmm. that set the base for uh yeah like i said what i was talking about before the belief of winning you know yeah. <laughs> then we go to aberdeen and we're like okay we've we've done this before let's do it again let's do yeah. it again yeah you know, and what, what do you uh, think was the the big difference between Lithuania and the the disappointments of being knocked out the Champions League? What the, the, so, is sometimes it's just about moments in the game that you know maybe you had a shot and it went in and it just it just changes something mentally yeah. as well to just give you that belief. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's 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 football can be like rolling the dice. Yeah, <laughs> played a game yesterday and we have sixty five percent of the ball. We play a team that's uh, fighting at the bottom for survival we lost one nil they had two shots on target the score of one you know it's uh <laughs> but that's also why we play football that's why the fans love it i think yeah you know it's uh <laughs> saying they're smiling now and it's pissing me off but you know it's uh it's the way it's the way it is you, you're not yeah. going to win every game yeah not even man city will win every game right yeah. <laughs> So, and as a, as a footballer, Johan, you know, obviously <laughs> you're, you're third in the table at the moment and you've had that annoying defeat at the weekend. How much attention do you pay to other teams' results on the tables? Because I know a lot of footballers will say, you know, it's week on week, we just take a game as it comes. But do you pay attention to outside factors? Yeah, I do. I do. Because yeah. uh, I feel like that shapes your own games mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's uh, the first 10, 15 rounds of the league, maybe not so much because yes. a lot can happen and yeah. the gaps are always really close. You like six points from relegation and six ones points from the top. Like it's, you go either way. But then when this, the league starts settling after like, yeah, I'd say 20 games, mm -hmm. 
and you come into the autumn now for us, then that's when yeah, you, you have to man up and uh, yeah, then looking at the table is one of those things you yeah. <laughs> you start chasing the other teams, right? Yeah. And then obviously, you know, back to Europe, you, you faced Aberdeen and you were actually you, you were sent off in that game. Yeah. Yeah. I was. What's what's that like when it when it's such a big game and that occurs? Um what what's that sort of like mentally as you're walking off the pitch, knowing that you know the team is down to ten men, and you know you're one of the <laughs> players as well. Yeah, that was tough. It was tough. It was right at the end of this game, so it was like the 88th or 89th minute. So I thought like this game won't be an issue, yeah. but it really like uh, hurt me that I wasn't going to play the the re re game down in Scotland. Uh, Oh, down in up in Scotland, I should <laughs> <talk. Yeah. laughs> So that that really got to me. Uh, my wife also has a few, a few family members uh, from uh, Scotland, so she's from Liverpool. Yeah, oh, the right. family you the ones you met the TNS that was her family. Yep. Ah, right, okay. Uh, she so that, came right. down from Liverpool, so uh, yeah. So she has uh, some cousins and stuff, uncles living up in Scotland. They were going to go watch the game, and I was like looking forward to like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> playing in front of them and like yeah. talking to them and, and then it just didn't happen so that was a disappointment but yeah. the team did really well yeah so in that situation when you've been sent off does that just mean you don't travel at all yeah it, it, sometimes you can i think if i w- would have wanted to i could have done it but yeah. we've traveled so much so for like uh, restitution uh, yeah. and recovery it's uh, probably best to stay home to be honest spend some time with the family as well because you we don't yeah. see them a lot right now <laughs> yeah so and you, you mentioned your wife. I I presume that you met her when you were an Everton player. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what... a Liverpool fan, unfortunately, but I gave her an Everton right. shirt. <laughs> second, second day or something. So. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't mind me asking, Johan, what's that like? That when when as a footballer, your job takes you potentially all over the world. Um, what was that like? The conversation you had when you when you moved back to Malmo in terms of the relationship and. And obviously, your wife moving to Sweden with you. Yeah, we never really had a, them conversations. We just no. kind of happened. It's, yeah. uh, I think that's a healthy sign. We didn't have to yeah. sit down and talk. We just went yeah. with it, and it worked out. So uh, yeah. she's she's got a Swedish passport now, and a really oh, good well. job here and everything. So it's uh, she's settled in really well. She yeah. talks Swedish, and yeah. yeah, even though we spoke, we speak mostly English at home. It's still she she understands everything. So yeah. she's. She's forty uh, percent Swedish now, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> so when you when you like, so for example, before you made your hack and move, and your agent, you know, maybe messages you to say there's interest. Um, can the moves come around quite quick? And what, what's it like in terms of you know moving moving house so swiftly? And obviously, as I say, your wife is moving as well. You know, and it, sometimes it comes unexpectedly. Yeah, it does. For, I, I've been quite lucky there. Yeah, everything for me is. Okay, my previous team was also in Gothenburg, so I haven't moved. I've been eight right. years in Gothenburg almost, which yeah. is very, very like unlikely as a football player, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so that's worked out really well for especially my kids to be able to have the same school and friends and everything. Uh, but yeah, it's now in the summer. I had interest from other teams, and right. uh, it was like waking up in the morning of one of the European games. You have a phone call and it's like an agent saying, oh, I have a team for you. Are you interested? And then it's like, shit, I have to make a decision like within 24 hours here, whether we're moving or not. And like, it's, yeah. uh, it, it's difficult at times. Yeah. Not, there's not a lot of them days, but the days it does happen, it's really hard. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, my, my love for Hicken is big now. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I was, I was going to say, you know, what, what would it, for, for the, for the story that you've enjoyed at Hacken? It it would take I I expect a really big move for for you to to decide to switch. Yeah, it would like mm. it, it needs to be something like financially unbelievable just to yeah. just to give my kids and my wife like a good safe future. Yeah. But uh, if it's something that isn't like out of the world money, then I would never do it because the yeah. the, the journey we're on with Hicken is so interesting and and uh, yeah, I love the club on like a personal level now. So yeah. So when obviously this summer that the big story has been Saudi Arabia, when you talk about finances, because you know this is your career, do you completely understand why so many players have made that move? I, I don't know. I'm like still trying to figure out what I think about it. Yeah. To be honest, right. uh, <laughs> it's. Um, I understand if you're 35, 
mm-hmm. first of all. I understand that. Like, you're not going to do much for European football, like Ronaldo or whatever. Like, go, do do your thing, right? But if you if you're in your prime years, was it Ruben Neves? Yeah, he's something? gone. Yeah, bit, bit early, I think, for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> it's a job. If someone offers you 20 times what you earn yep. for doing the same thing somewhere else, would you do it? Uh, you probably would, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say no to, to these crazy amounts. It's yep. the amounts shouldn't be these amounts because it's not healthy, but football is more than just sport. Now it's like a, it's almost like a, religion sounds corny but it kind of is yeah, well, yeah absolutely and so you, you know you remain with Hacken and you're in the Europa League uh, you've got Mulder, Karabakh and you've got Bayer Leverkusen how exciting is that? yeah really exciting I was hoping for Liverpool to be honest yeah <laughs> try and give them a good game but uh, no it's really it's really exciting now now we have like a realistic chance of possibly getting through to the next stage so uh, on a sports level this would be the best uh, draw we could have, I think, uh, on mm-hmm. a uh, entertainment level. We could have ended up with Ajax and Marseille in, in that group. Yeah. But uh, this, I think we have a good chance to, to, to go through and uh, we, we're going to do our very best to do that. I think. Yeah, because I, I, as I mentioned, you know, Hacken, I, I mentioned Brighton. And I think, is there a chance that you could maybe take some teams by surprise as well? Yeah, I think so. I think mm-hmm. so. Like we had that like fuck you mentality, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we 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 don't we're not scared of anyone. Like we're gonna do our thing. And uh yeah. like I said, we, we're gonna play by like a few weeks and uh, why change what's been our uh, success so far? There's no there's no point. Let's just try and develop that style against mm-hmm. good teams. Because if yeah. we can do it against them, then that gives us a good belief that we can do it against the teams in Alsvenskan as well. Yeah. And obviously you've you've played so many games already this summer, but when you come up against Bayer Leverkusen, how much uh, planning will go into it, and how much how much detail about that club will you be given? Yeah, we we're very uh, we get handed a lot of details. Yep. We have uh, the video video analyzers that they give us a good platform of who we're playing against. So it's probably easier against Leverkusen because it's a team you can watch, like on yep. TV, and you get a good idea. But Karabakh, for example, they as a Bajan league, no idea, no no one knows. <laughs> so that's when you need more information on like, yeah, what's it like, and yeah. So uh, they hand us the information we we need, and we uh, you listen to what you want, uh, mm-hmm. take on board the things that will help you, and uh, yeah. So say for example, Karabakh have a, a six foot six striker who's very strong, and you're you're given that information, and you may dig out some YouTube videos. What's it like in terms of watching and thinking what to expect and then the first 10 minutes of that game is it usually that you've you've sort of worked that out quite well or can it be a bit of a surprise sometimes yeah no it's the first 10 minutes are always interesting in these games it's funny yeah. you say that because they really are you yeah. play teams you've never played before from leagues you know like the Faroe Island team we the first 10 minutes it's almost like boxing you stand yeah. there and you're figuring out like what what's their move where do they place their players if we play on the right side What's the offensive marking like? Do they stay up with a lot of men? Do are they very like loyal yeah. in the defense with the strikers as well? Can we push them down? Is the back line high? Like, do we need to like play behind them at the beginning to like stretch them a little bit, or do they drop early to give a space? It's so much you think about uh, at the beginning. So uh, yeah, the first 10, 15 minutes are always interesting. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in these games, it's uh, it can be either way. So <laughs> we kind of like said that before our games. Like, let's not wait those ten minutes when they're waiting. Yeah, let's get a little head start. Let's see if we can like crack them open early here and yeah. uh, and uh, do our thing. And do you think that was part of the reason why the shock result came in the Faroe Islands? Just because you know you do have to work things out, and as you said before, football can be like a roll of the dice. Yeah, that's. That's exactly why. That's right. uh, that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And what if you know it? Hopefully, when Hack can get through the group, um, you mentioned playing Liverpool before. <laughs> yeah, I think we might like? we might get them. I think, yeah, I think it's a possibility, that. right? If we finish second and they win their group, I think that's yeah. the team we will be playing. 
Yeah. So uh, you know that's uh, again like we it's gonna be difficult, no doubt about it going to Anfield, but we'll we'll follow the same game plan. I mean, it's what we know. So uh, mm-hmm. if we if we lose five nil, then yeah. then we need we need we know we need to get better at our game plan. But yeah. uh, it's uh, we've got nothing to lose, right? So <laughs> let's go out and try and play. Yeah, and I've got to ask as well. Uh, obviously, when you moved to Merseyside, what was the Scouse accent like? Did you pick it up quite easy? Were you able to understand? Uh, the first few months was hard. We were like, <laughs> imagine you're going to the change room, you're going to like a, a a shower and it's echoing in the shower and you're trying to listen to them and keep up and they're asking you questions and you're like, huh? Because yeah. <laughs> like I said, when I moved, everything was like London for me. I, yeah. I was expecting the same accent and everything, but it was so different. So, but I, uh, yeah, I picked it up quickly. I speak a bit of scale stuff myself, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I can, I can switch it on anyway. I don't do it right now, but honestly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> And with your wife being from Merseyside, have you had opportunities to come back to Everton? <laughs> I have met people from Everton. I haven't been a Finch farm. I would right. really like to. But yeah. I uh, stay in touch with uh, people in the club. Jonathan Williams, who works with... Uh, is he still there? Dave Harrison. He's just gone to Man United. He's just gone to Man U. Yeah, he went right. in the okay. summer. Yeah, yeah. Right, so is Jonathan taking over that role or did someone else come in? Um, I think it was taken over. Yeah. So it was. Ju- it was just sort of yeah. Because they they he, he was pictured a lot with the with the new signings. So right. he was affectionately called Contract Dave. <laughs> yeah, I, remember, I saw these yeah. pictures, the memes, and all that. It was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like there, no one knows who he is, but he's always there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that that's uh, as you mentioned about the stability of the football club. Obviously, uh, Dave left. Uh, Jimmy Martin, the kit man, also retired this summer. So there's there's a lot of change, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I had Jimmy Martin. It's, he was a he was a yeah. It's new times, right? And that's yep. where the the club has to uh, adapt and find ways yeah. together. Absolutely. So uh, even with the kit man, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so just finally, Johan, you know what 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 do you expect for for Everton this season and in the future? I expect a lot of good home games, especially yeah. uh, the, the two home games they've had has been really good, like much better than the ones last year, even though they haven't won yet. So uh, it was the first game against was a Fulham. Yeah, it was just for me that was like a five nil win to Everton, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I couldn't I couldn't believe it that they lost, and then the next one against Wolves. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, the, yeah. the header on the line, the back post header mm-hmm. save on the line, and then. Yeah, they, I'm expecting good things from Everton, to be honest. And just to ask you, Anu, it'd be interesting to hear from a, a professional's uh, perspective. Obviously, Everton didn't have a, a centre-forward for, for sort of 18 months with Cavett lewin being injured, and obviously Neil Morpai is a, is a different sort of profile to him. When, when as a centre-back, if you don't have that focal point up top, is that a really difficult situation to be in? Yeah, I think... Uh... <laughs> Everton's always had big strikers. Yeah, it's their identity. And if you play with one striker like Sean Dyche is doing now, you need either someone who's really quick, like mm-hmm. really like really pacey to like stretch the team, or you need someone who is big. And I feel like obviously Cavalier and is a great player, and he can do a bit of both. So that's why he was very good for Everton. And he's, he's very good for Everton. Yeah. But I feel like Mopai maybe caught in between a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. didn't do much of anything. Yeah. Uh, needed someone else next to him. So I think this, yeah, I like this Beto guy so far. Uh, he just, like, he takes responsibility, you know. Yeah. And I, I like that, you know. Even in the tough times, I think he's going to be, like, the go-to guy, you know. And that's what Everton needs. So, uh, yeah. a, a good character. Uh, Robbie Keane, uh, right, what's his name? It's Robbie Keane, isn't it? Robbie Keane? Oh, Roy, right. Roy Keane. Roy, uh, Roy Keane, that's the one, yeah. Roy Keane. Roy Keane. Yeah, yeah. On, on Sky, he always talks about characters and teams. And then it, it gets boring after a while. It's every time he talks about yeah. that. But, <laughs> but he, has a, he has a good point, though. Mm, and uh, absolutely. and uh, there's, there's good characters in the team now. Yeah. So, uh, it's really cool, Johan, to know that you still watch Everton as well from afar. Yeah, always. 
I, yeah. I will for sure. I will always yeah. follow and, and yeah. uh, see how it goes. So yeah. uh, I, uh, it's not many places left now that I did come across. It's mm. Seamus Coleman. It's almost like the only one. But uh, yeah. is he back soon or? Yeah, I think I think it was. Uh, it's probably just over a month. I think um, that he'll be back. Um, but obviously, Leighton Baines as well is is a coach at Everton now. 18s or yeah, under 18s, yeah, yeah. So I, th- I think yeah, I will try and speak to Jonathan Williams. I'll try and go out to Finch Farm next time I'm yeah. over to say hello Absolutely. to a few people. Even though yeah. it's ten years ago, and I think a lot of people left. There's probably yeah. still a few that I can say. Oh, hello definitely. To. Oh, it was uh, amazing to talk to you, and I love all the insights and the and the memories. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we'll do it again. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's plenty Keep more to talk to, so let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cheers, yeah. One and good luck for the for the season. And you know, Thank fingers you. crossed you get Liverpool and knock them out. <laughs> yeah, that's that would be full circle shit, yeah. that wouldn't. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Thanks a lot, Johan. Thank See you, you so much. See you.